October 30th, we're back at 21 Soho with Ian Brody talking about life in and out of the Lightning Seeds and John Higgs on the KLF. Tickets below. Well, welcome to another word in your ear. And if you uh, happen to spend a lot of time in London, you will have noticed over the last few years that the um, the area around Tottenham Court Road has been uh, devastated by Crossrail, and uh, it's only recently starting to emerge from that uh, from that chaos. Um, one of the thoroughfares, tiny thoroughfares, that's been most affected by that is Denmark Street which is, of course, known to anybody ever involved in the music business as, as London's Tim Pan Alley, where uh, I suppose music publishing was very much based back in the day. And uh, and thankfully, its history is now recorded in a book called Denmark Street, London Street of Sound. And we're joined by the author, Peter Watts. Hello, Peter. How are you doing? Hi, I'm very good. Good to see you, David. Is this a place that you'd uh, you'd gone down many many times in the past? Have you, have you spent much yeah, time? Yeah, personally, there? I had. I mainly, to be honest, I use it as a shortcut. I'm not a musician as such, so all the instrument shops didn't have a great deal of um, you know, I, I, you'd look in the windows, but they didn't. I never went in any of them. But then I used to go to Helter Skelter, the bookshop, when that was there, um, and I went to the Twelve Bar when, a lot. So that that was my Denmark Street. Right. So it's it, it's round there. It's a very old part of London, isn't it? I suppose all of London's quite old, but that's got particular historical significance, hasn't it, round there? St Giles is what we refer to it as historically. Is that right? The wider parish, absolutely. So, you know, it was it was outside the sort of city of London and it wasn't quite in the west in the in Westminster. So it was a sort of in-between place. And for a long time, it was a site of um, a sort of leper hospital. Right. Um, and then as sort of London got bigger, um, it was built on. But it was always a little bit dissolute. It was a, there was a sort of, um, you know, there was a huge slum there called the Rookery, um, which remained the case for hundreds of years. It's where Hogarth sort of based Gin Lane. And it always had that slightly um, kind of insalubrious vibe, which I think it had up until very, very recently. Um and Denmark Street itself was intended to be a sort of attempt to gentrify that area. It's quite, it was quite grand. It was meant, it was meant to be for sort of, you know, sort of richer, richer Georgians originally. Um, you know, some quite grand houses were built down there. So when did music first start being, um, based there? So music began there in 1911. This is the sort of um, the sort of the sort of date that's generally given. There was um, a very small office by one of the publishers, Francis Day and Hunter. They had a small subsidiary office there, but um, before that. But in 1911, there was a guy called Lawrence Wright. He was a music publisher from the Midlands. Um, he owned the um, the copyright to um, a song called "Don't Go Down in the Mine, Dad," and there was a mining disaster in Cumbria. Um, in 1910 and this song became incredibly popular in the music halls he owned the rights to print the sheet music he made a fortune um, he gave half the money to the um, to the relief fund for the miners families and he used the rest to move to Denmark Street and he chose Denmark Street because uh, music publishing was literally publishing it was a branch of, of of the book selling industry and you had all the bookshops on Charing Cross Road and yes. Denmark Street was a logical place to sell sheet music because that was how people, you know, listened to music. You had to buy the sheet music so you could play it yourself. Do we know how many pianos there were in uh, this oh, is Edwardian they, England? They were, they were everywhere. They were everywhere. Have you ever seen the film um, London Nobody Knows? Um, yeah, yeah, which has got James Mason. There's a great scene in that where they're smashing up some of those old pianos. There were, they, you know, I think every house had a piano. Every pub had a piano um they were they were incredibly common so how did songs get to be popular at the time so this, this is yeah. pre-radio isn't it this is pre-radio pre so I, I really love this idea of, of music then the only way to really experience it was to hear it live that was literally the only thing not many people would have had you know the sort of old 78s would they i mean they were they were they were they were, they were really expensive and hard to get so if you wanted to hear music you'd go to um you know you go to a music hall you go to the club, 
you go to dance or, or you know and there'd be someone in the piano playing it like you would have a jukebox you'd have like a human jukebox someone would be playing and they'd be playing the most popular songs in the music hall so if you were a publisher what you would do is you want a songwriter to come to you they give you a song you buy it off them you get that played in the music hall you'd hope it would be sort of catchy and sort of uh, memorable enough for people in the music hall to want to hear it in the local pub and that's how you got a hit and you could sell millions of copies of sheet music doing this so did they tend to be songs that people could join in with? Yes. So I think when you look at those songs, um, those sort of early sort of sort of pre, you know, up until the Second World War, they've often got, a, you know, quite catchy title. Um, they've often got a sort of, you know, a simple melody. They're, you know, they're things like, you know, I've got a lovely bunch of coconuts. Yes. You know, it's a sort of teddy, teddy bear's picnic. It's this sort of, you know, it wasn't all like that, but quite a lot of, what you might call novelty songs, but kind of funny, maybe a bit saucy. And the other one was, you know, sentimental, you know, really maudlin sentimental songs like, you know, Don't Go Down in the Mind, Dad. Um, these were the things that really, you know, grabbed people who would only hear it once in a musical and then want to hear it again. Right. So, but, but people very quickly started to make a lot of money out of this. Well, the publishers did. I don't know if anyone else did. I mean, if you were a songwriter, you kind of had the chance to um, either sort of sell the song outright or retain a, a, a ownership of it and ha and get some sort of royalties um, off the sheet music. Um, a lot of songwriters, you know, just sold out. They just sold a song for 30 quid. Um, that was a decent amount of money. That was a week's wages, probably more than that. Yeah, um, um, so, you know, they were happy to do that, but it did mean that you did have, you know, in later years, people whose songs, you know, the guy who wrote Sally, for instance, which was a massive hit, uh, for Gracie Fields. Um, you know, he was, he ended his days, you know, playing that song in a, in a pub in Camden for, for, you know, for, for, for beer money. Other people that, like Jimmy that, Kennedy that told. That wasn't written for Gracie Fields, was it? It was, it was, it had been around, hadn't it, Sally? It had been around, but it was eventually claimed by Gracie Fields, really. I mean, that was one of the, one of the jobs of the publisher also was to, was to sort of, um, line up the song with the right performer. Um, and, you know, and, and quite often this would involve a little, you know, the plugger would, would do this job, the old plugger. I mean, radio plugs, but in those days it was pluggers whose job was to basically bribe you know, the dance hall leader or the singer to, to do the song that they wanted to, um, to, 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 to be the hit. Right. So if you'd gone down Denmark Street in, in, in the 30s, give us an idea what it would have been like. Would you have you've had a load of music publishers down there by yeah, then? Yeah, you would. You've had a lot of music publishers and they'd have been on all the ground floor offices, uh, the shops, you know, where the music shops are. And they would have had, you know, the, the, the sheet music in the window, um, you know, to sort of entice you in. So they were part retail, but also... You know, people would go in and try and sell songs. So there's often a piano on the ground floor. Um, you know, they had this thing called the Old Grey Whistle Test, which was the idea that... The, Explain um, that. Go on. Is that... Yeah. That's where it comes from, is it? Go that's on. where it comes from. So that's the idea that if the kind of the doorman, who was often kind of, you know, ex-military, grey-haired um, ex-soldier, if he could whistle the melody of the song that had just been played, then it was memorable enough for the, for the, for the publisher to, um, to take a punt on it. And that was that. That became known as the old grey whistle test. So, and pe so, pe people so legend have, has it. People would have receptionists and so forth who could who could play the piano. Couldn't? Is that yeah, that yeah, the case? yeah? Post boys. I mean, you know, even in the sixties, you know, El, you know, as part of what Elton John was doing was 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 doing some of that. You know, it, it, you needed people who could play the piano. One of the songwriters, um, Harry Leon, who was a real character, he kind of had this deal where. Um, one of the publishers had missed out on one of his songs that they later became a hit. So then they agreed to always give him like a fiver for every song he brought them. So what he would do is he had a, a deal with the guy at the publishers who would play it really badly on purpose. And then he could go and take it. Then he would get his fiver and then sell it somewhere else for, you know, another fiver and double his money. But this was the basis of the music business, wasn't it? In the thirties, yes. it was songs and sheet music rather than rather it was than songs and sheet music. And, and I guess the other interesting thing is that it wasn't even the perform. I mean, obviously, a performer like Gracie Fields could make a song huge, but generally speaking, it was about the song, not the performance. So, you know, you get the same song performed by multiple people, and that was considered, you know, absolutely fair, fair play. There was no sense of of ownership in that way. Right, right. So people people valued you know melody and songs with plots and so forth. That's what they were looking for, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yes. Things they could sing along to, things they could play at home, 
Um, yeah. Right. So when would you say was the heyday of Denmark Street? Seems to be really interesting because we all think about Denmark Street as being this sort of like amazing place in the 60s when, you know, the, when sort of the, the rock and roll generation were, were, were there. But I think it probably in, in terms of its kind of cultural importance, it was arguably before that when it was, you know, when everything, all the publishers were there, they were the equivalent of the record labels. Um, and, you know, almost every major song that was being, that was being played in, in a music hall or in a dance hall in, in, in the UK would have come through Denmark Street, including a lot from America. That's how a lot of the American songs by, you know, the likes of Irving Berlin would have entered England through, you know, subsidiaries of the, um, of the American publishers. So explain the expression Tin Pan Alley. Uh, so that there's Tin Pan Alley was, was, was a, was, was a direct lift from America, from New York, where there was Tin Pan Alley in New York, where all the American songwriters and publishers were based. And there's lots of different stories about why it was called that. One of them is that um, if there was a songwriter who was like performing his song, the publishers in the next old door office would be banging away, making as much noise as they could to kind of disrupt the sound of the um, of the performance. Um, I, I like to think it's probably much more likely that with all the sort of noise of music spilling out of the windows, it would have sounded like a lot of tin pan, you know, a lot of tin pans being crashing together. Right, right. So just getting to the second, after the, after the war, you get the entry of what we now recognise as contemporary pop music with kind mm -hmm. of Cliff Richard and the Shadows and the Beatles and so forth. So how does how does the culture of Denmark Street and Tim Pennelly interact with this new generation who some of whom can write their own songs because this has yeah. not been known before this is this no. is a huge sea change isn't it it's a massive sea change so you had kind of a couple of things happening and and Denmark Street was what I what I found interesting about Denmark Street was how adaptable it's always been you know the music industry has to adapt to, to changes in technology and Denmark Street kind of reflects that so one of the first things that happened was demo studios began to appear in the 50s because suddenly people could cut records for quite cheap that replaced the old sort of guy playing the piano suddenly you had those records that was one big change um and then the other big change was obviously um people writing their own songs um, and so you had the Beatles who, but you still needed the old fashioned publisher to kind of open a few doors. So when Brian Epstein was sort of, you know, shopping around for, um, for a publisher for the Beatles, because he felt that the first Beatles single hadn't been given a big of enough push by EMI, he went to, he asked George Martin what George Martin recommended. George Martin suggested this guy called Dick James, who had, um, who they'd worked with for years. George Martin had, had, um, produced, um, Dick James's big hit, the Robin Hood theme tune. Um, and so, you know, that, that was how that connection happened. That was how Dick James took that job. But Dick James was kind of smart enough, you know, he, he, he wasn't amazing as most of these publishers weren't. They were all looking for, looking out for their own end. But he did sort of recognize that the Beatles were significantly different, that they were performers and they were songwriters in one. And this was a whole new deal. And he set up, he suggested they set up Northern Songs so they could retain ownership of their own publishing. And that was a completely unique relationship. But what that did was, kind of diminished the general role of the publishers. They, they sort of, from that moment on, their job shifted from kind of talent spotters um, to, to basically royalty collectors. Money and collectors, yes. And copyright protectors. Yes. That, yeah. And, and that, that's what happened. But Denmark Street adapted to that. And, and because it was already there with the, with the record, you know, with, with those demo studios like Regent Sound where the Stones recorded and loads of other people, other things like agents started moving in there, you know, managers were in there. And, and, and so there was still a whole sort of like, you know, ecology of, of, of different people related to the music industry. So, you know, the publishers were no longer as important, but other things were taking their place. So you had the Stones recording there, you had the Beatles signing a publishing deal there. You had David Bowie going down there, like, you know, recruiting band members. You had Jimmy Page playing on demo sessions there you know all these things were still happening um and 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 the architecture of the place was was able to adapt it and 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 it still had that kind of important role in between Covent Garden and Soho there was still this need for physical networking to take place and it was as good a place as any so the I often think it's a miracle that the first Rolling Stones album came out of Denmark Street was it Regent Sound in Denmark? Yeah, 
wasn't it? It really, which I still think, controversial opinion, I still think it's their best record. It was made in about a day. You know? it was, and it was, it was made on like a one track, wasn't it? I mean, <laughs> it's just ridiculous. mind-boggling. I mean, Andrew Lou Goldham, he, he'd first been down to Denmark Street in the 50s to try and sell a song of his own called Boomerang Rock, which was a kind of like Tommy Steele knockoff number. And he'd been, um, he'd been knocked back by the guys who, who'd written, um, I've got a lovely bunch of coconuts. But, you know, he, he persevered. And, and, and it's interesting that one of the first Stones photo shoots took place on Denmark Street, that amazing Terry, Terry O'Neill shot of them behind the Tim Pan Alley Club, the sort of bright red background. And then when they were looking for a studio, you know, he would have known Regent Sound. He knew Denmark Street, and he wanted somewhere that they could take, where they could make mistakes, where they could take their time, where they would get their character across. Um, and it was, you know, it was a polar opposite of Abbey Road. It was the complete Absolutely. opposite. Absolutely, and and that was very, very deliberate choice by by Lou Goldham, who, who recorded a lot of stuff there um, himself uh, for a media and with the Andrew Lou Goldham Orchestra. You know, he really loved Regent Street, Regent Sound. Um, you know, other people who worked there just hated it. Like Shell, Shell Talmy hated it. Yes. But, um, it, it, it worked for um, it worked for Lou Gold. I mean, it worked for the Stones. They did the first and most of the second album there. But it was really kind of egg boxes on the wall as, oh, as yeah. kind of soundproofing, wasn't it? Exactly. It was really basic. What they had was a very good engineer. Um, they had a guy called Bill Farley who was a brilliant engineer, apparently. And and you listen to that album, and as you say, you know, it. It leaks, it's, but it, but, but it, but it's, you can hear it's, everything. It's an incredible record. I think it's an extraordinary record. And I was after reading your book, I was thought, I've got to look up Bill Farley. What happened to him? Disappeared without trace, as yeah. far as I can tell. You know what I mean? Which is tragic, yeah. really, because he he produced what is a, I I still think one of the greatest rock and roll records ever made. The first yeah. Rolling Stones album. I mean, there's something about that album and that photo of the Stones, and you can just imagine what a shock that would have been to those publishers who were still based on Denmark Street, who were very much shirt and tie and, you know, very yeah, yeah, sort yeah. of, you know, old proper old businessmen. And then suddenly you had these, you know, these, they must look like aliens. Yes. So moving forward, jumping forward an entire, well, pretty much a decade, Hypnosis, the sleeve designers, ended up there, didn't they? Because it was, it was just a bit of a magnet for music business related activities yeah. i mean a lot of some of this is coincidence in a way because i don't think hypnosis you know i've i've, I've interviewed um poe po, po loads of times and you know i don't think they deliberately wanted to be on denmark street because it was denmark street but it was cheap the publishers and the reason for that the publishers were, were leaving you know they, their job they were being bought out by the record labels oh. the record labels didn't want to be in denmark street it was wasn't grand enough for them no. um so there was a lot of sort of you know spare office space going and and you know hypnosis it was perfect they could they took over an old dance studio i think is where is where they went there was a there was just one piano there which they sold according to poe and used the money to kind of buy all their equipment um and they were at number six they were above a greek bookshop um and they had the first floor there and then later on they took the second floor and it was totally squalid i mean you know <laughs> the, the, some of the fit pictures i've seen of it and you know they used to like the toilet was so bad they used to just pee in the dark room sink that was the um tradition um and it always was a bit kind of you know it was always a little bit left behind denmark street like, they were always going to get round to doing it up a little bit later on i think at this time the kind of um there was a, the go, the, the kind of center point was looming above it and it was under a bit of threat of redevelopment as part of a wider. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so, you know, I think there's the people who own the offices, they had no reason to want to do it up because they thought the whole thing might get flattened at any moment. So in case it wasn't sleazy enough, they were then joined by the Sex Pistols. <laughs> yes. And again, I think Malcolm McLaren, uh, again, it's coincidence. Glenn Matlock saw an advert in Melody Maker for Bad Fingers, former rehearsal space, and, you know, answers the ad. And M but Malcolm McLaren, again, he knows his music history. He would have loved to have been there. He'd have said, this is it. We're inside the belly of the beast. We're going to disrupt the industry from within, just like Lou Goldham. So they took over this old um, workshop behind number six in the in the sort of backyard behind Hypnosis, uh, Steve Jones and Glenn Matlock were pretty much living there. Um, and it was where the Six Pistols, Six Pistols spent most of 75, um, but getting better, really, learning their songs. They recorded some songs there. Um, the Spunk demo was, was, was made, bootleg was made there. Some great photos were taken there by Bob Gruen. Um, 
It was really important uh, uh, for them. So the first Sex Pistols recordings were made just a few yards away from the first Stones recordings. Basically, yeah. Yeah, while the you know while while the sort of you know the the people who were making uh, the, the the album covers for Pink Floyd and Led Zeppelin were sort of you know look, looking out their back window at, at what was going on and kind of scratching their heads at these people who would tell them we hate Pink Floyd. <laughs> well, yeah, that that may be why the famous T-shirt that Johnny Rotten wore with the Pink Floyd yeah. T-shirt saying "I hate." I suppose Pink Floyd were very front of mind if you were a, if you were down Denmark Street. They, you touched on earlier the music shops, you know, the, so the mm-hmm. guitar shops and the yeah. instrument shops that move in around there, you know, which, which make it a magnet for uh, for would-be musicians. Yeah, a lot of those were owned by the same people. Is that the case? Yeah, that is the case. That is the case. So I think for a lot of people, that's what they know about Denmark Street is the instrument shops. But, you know, they didn't really sort of start appearing until the 70s in any great numbers. Um, there was Macari's was on there before, and then the shop called Top Gear opened at the end of the 60s. And that's the one that really made Denmark Street trendy. And what they cottoned on to was the fact that, again, there's loads of musicians here. There's one thing musicians all need is instruments. So it's a great place to be. Um, and it started, you know, it started to snowball. And there was a guy called Cliff Cooper who had um, recorded with Joe Meek, and he invented the Orange Amp. Um, and in, he wanted a showroom to sell his amp, took it to Denmark Street, and then sort of gradually bought up most of the north side of the street, opening various shops, selling different types of instrument, um, taking over some that already existed and changing the name, um, until he had almost the entire north side of the street. And, and he told me that, you know, that they, they were, they were getting through so much money in the eighties that it wasn't safe to go out on the street. So they, 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 they sort of knocked holes through the walls so they could pass it from one end of the street to the other without having to, um, step outside. And this is all cash money in those days, presumably. Yes. It's free credit cards. But there was no point shopping around because they were all owned by the same guy. Therefore, the prices would largely be the same, wouldn't they? Yeah, I think that what he did was, you know, he, he had one shop that was, he, he had shops of different types of instruments. So he'd have a guitar shop and he'd have a bass shop and he had a keyboard shop and he had a sheet music and he had, um, you know, sort of woodwind and, you know, so he had a various types and there were also dotted around other, you know, Macari's was still there. You know, there were other independent shops there as well. Um, especially later in the eighties when like Andy's guitars opened and, and there were others like that. Um, so there was a certain amount of, um, of, of genuine competition. Oh, okay. Cause there was uh, somebody told me years ago that all the hi fi shops on Tottenham Court Road are all owned by the same company. Yeah. No so you used no to go problem. in and you used to go in and they'd, they'd send you up the road and say they got it up there. And that used to always throw me. <laughs> So, as I mentioned earlier, this is this whole area has been uh, has been there's been great upheaval in the light of uh, of Crossrail. Mm. What have, what have they done to Denmark Street? So Denmark Street is listed. So there's a certain amount that they can't do. Um, and then there was a sort of a bit of a sort of public battle to kind of make sure that the developers retained the kind of integrity, the musical integrity of the street. Because even after the, um, you know, the music shops, you had things like Helter Skelter Bookshop, you had the 12 Bar Club, you had, um, you know, you had like one of the first companies to develop internet streaming was on Denmark Street. Um, you had uh, Acid Jazz label on there. You know, this stuff, this had continued and, and, and the, the, um, the sort of campaigners wanted it to stay that way. And they, they, they got, um, you know, a sort of um, assurances from Camden and the developers that they would always offer any new lease to a music related business. So that hopefully should provide some protection, but then you're open to the interpretation of what music related means in 2023 and going forward. Um, but physically not much has changed. They've had to knock down one, one, one of the, um, old buildings on the north side to create access to Tottenham Court Road tube. Um, behind it, loads of works happened where they built the outer net. Um, which is this kind of really bizarre, hard to sort of describe sort of futuristic development, which is like being inside a kind of like being inside a light show at times. Like they just screen stuff on the walls around you and they'd show a lot of adverts, but they also show just stuff like clouds or like spirals. And it's kind of one of the trippiest places in London. Um, they built a new concert venue underneath one of those spots. Um, on Denmark Street itself, I think one of the real problems is 
what what an interest about Denmark Street isn't just what happened on the ground floor. It's what was going on in the offices above. You know, as you said, all those different uses. You know, from sort of you know art studios to to tour managers, and now all of that certainly on the south side, which is what's reopened, has been turned into a a, a boutique hotel, um, bedrooms for a, for a fancy hotel. So it's 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 really lost a lot of that kind of real right. character i mean i went up there to interview a guy who was like you know he was fixing guitars and you know he was welding away lighting his cigarette with his welding device and <laughs> you know as he fixed this les paul and you know those, those sort of those sort of places of there's there's no room for them anymore all right so if you were advising somebody who was going to visit there and have a look what, what was that what bit you would point them towards as uh as, uh, I guess know. what what I would say is, you know, it, you can still look in the windows at the guitars and marvel at the prices. Of, some of them are extraordinary. There's the um, the twelve bar is now the lower third. So if you go of an evening, you might see a you know you might see a, a, a folk gig or a or a or a, or a show. Um, I think a lot of the history though is still kind of not really celebrated. There's a plaque above the Giaconda Cafe. But it spells Giaconda wrong, you know, and it says this was the site of Tin Pan Alley. But it also dates it. It says nineteen, you know, nineteen eleven to I think nineteen ninety two. Like, like it all ended then, whereas it, it didn't. Um, you know, you, you you can walk past Number Four Regent Sound, and it says Regent Sound because that's now the name of the guitar shop. But you might necessarily know what took place there. You can walk past Number Six, and you'd have no idea that this is where is the that, Sex Pistols. Yeah, there, there ought to recorded. be some. There ought to be some small equivalent to the blue plaque, didn't they? Just dealt with kind of small things. In uh, well, you could put one on every window. You, you could, know, you really and, could, and say this is what happened. And maybe they will. You know, maybe they will. Um, because, as you say, you know, you wouldn't know. And and there is there is almost no musician from the twentieth century who hasn't been on Denmark Street at some time or other. I mean, it really is probably the most sort of, you know, compact street of musical history in 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 London, probably in maybe even in the world. There, well, there you go, and and that that story is told in Peter's book, Denmark Street, London's Street of Sound, out now. <laughs> 